today we have a legend in the building. Former Bantamweight champion, former super Bantamweight champion, and former world featherweight champion, Australia's own, the legend, Jeff Fennick. Regarded by many as probably the best inside fighter ever in boxing. Fought with tons of heart, was super exciting, had his classic wars against Azuma Nelson, and many, many more. This is an exciting day. Let's get right into it. There he is. How's that, matey? Is that right, Marco? Beautiful. Works beautiful. How you doing, champ? Feeling great. Everything's great. You're uh, you're back in Australia, huh? Yeah, we've been away for a long time, but yeah, happy to be home with family, so it's great. Yeah, I heard you were you were just in uh, you were down in LA, right? I was in Vegas for like five or six weeks, in LA for a couple of weeks, uh, two and a half, three weeks. So it was pretty good. Loved it. I love America. I love the people there. Got some great friends there, so it was very, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, yeah, no, I, I can imagine. Um, wow. So, let me ask you a question. How many amateur fights did you have? I had twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. Now, is the amateur? I'm assuming, you know, because I fought amateur in the states, uh, but I, you know, I didn't get to the level where I was traveling all over the world like a lot of amateurs did. So, is the amateur system in, in Australia kind of the same as in the states? Yeah, it's definitely the same. Usually, guys. Who have done what I done had hundreds of fights, or you know, in the eighties or sixties. I mean, I went to the World Cup in Rome after my thirteenth or fourteenth fight, came third in the world. Then I went to Bangkok, I went to um, Jakarta, the Kings Cup, the Presidents Cup, and then I went to the Olympics after my twenty uh, fifth fight. And I went to the Olympic Games, and uh, the guys I fought at the Olympics, Marco had like between a hundred or the three guys I, I fought collectively had about six or seven hundred fights between them, and I had. 25. So no, it was a, it was like just something I think I was born to do. So, right. you, know, yeah, you know, absolutely. And you know, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to get ahead of myself yet, but you also challenged for a world title in your seventh pro fight, which is won the world title, excuse me, which is crazy. Um, Back then it was 15 rounds. So I fought, I fought, that's why it was 15. It didn't go 15. But after that, I fought uh, the fight after I had the rematch. And then I, I fought the fight after that, which went 15 rounds. I fought the fight that after that, they went 14 rounds. So I've, I've, you know, I've done the hard work, mate. You have, you have. Um, so, so, so as an amateur, what weight did you fight at? Uh, I started 48 kilos, and then I fought fly. Went to the Olympic Games as a flyweight. A 51, fly. 51 kilos, eight stone. Okay, okay. Um, and then when you turned pro, it was the same weight, correct? Yeah, I went from there, slowly moved up, went to, I fought at super flyweight first and then band and weight and then super band and weight and featherweight and went up. Right, right, right. Um, at what age did you begin boxing? I started at 17 and a bit. Just, I was just after my 17th birthday. I was just, uh, like I said, I never wanted to box. So I never watched, well, of course, I'd heard of Muhammad Ali, but I'd never watched a fight in my life except, you know, with my dad when he would watch Ali or something like that. But, um, yeah, I just um, I boxed by accident. I, was, um, I played football. I wanted to be a rugby league player all my life. And I went to a youth club, a police citizens youth club, and there was a boxing room there one day. And I looked through the window, and there was a little glass uh, window going through the door. And I seen a friend of mine who went to school, played football with me, and I sat down to watch him box. I heard the trainer say that he would have loved somebody to box with him. And because I was kind of cocky and thought that I could handle myself, I volunteered. Maybe the, look, the worst and the best thing I did, I didn't feel the best that day, getting winded and getting beat around, but um, they persuaded me to stay. And um, within, like I said, um, within, within two years, I went to the Olympic Games. Wow. Well, so when you, when you were growing up, you know, in, in, in middle school, high school, whatever, did you get in a lot of fights? Were you that kind of a guy or were you more kind of quiet into yourself? Uh, I was in a, yeah, I got in a fight every day. Yeah, we were, I was in a... <laughs> Well, we were in a gang when I was young. We used to go out and fight. We loved fighting. We loved, you know, going to certain venues and we'd meet other groups and fight. Yeah, that's what we done. Yeah. Did you have uh, Lee Priest 
up. Did you have before you actually learned how to fight? Were you were you not were you laying people out? Did you kind of be the natural talent? Yeah, well, I wasn't laying people out, but I was, I was just a little skinny kid. But I wasn't scared of nobody, and I always then you know I did my best. You know, wow. I would fight, I would, I would fight till the end. If I if I will. If I lost, I had to lose five times because like, I'd just clean myself and go back again. So I was that kind of kid. That's my outlook on life, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you were, you know, you were, in my opinion, one of the greatest inside fighters. You know, you, you were able to do so much with such little distance. Yeah, well, the Ring Magazine once rated me the best in fighter, better than Julio Cesar Chavez, which is a, a huge rap. Yeah, so, yeah, there was, it was written in print there, and I'm talking about. Chavez, they said he's the best in fighter, apart from one guy from Australia, Jeff Fennick, who, you know. So, yeah, but, uh, yeah, that was just, that's where I love being. Like, for me, in a fight, I feel safer in close and out wide. When you're out, I think that when you're at a distance, we're a 50-50 chance. When I'm in close and I know where I am and where my head is and where I can get, be hit with what punch, I, I feel very safe in there. Right, right. I mean, you were able, so is that something you worked on to be, you know, because only fighters know this, but to be able to get that leverage in those short shots, because some fighters need need distance, you know, to, to, to hit, to land the power at the punch. But did you work on those those short punches or that was kind of your style? Well, that was my style. But of course, yeah, the, the more I sparred, the more I done it. Obviously, mm. I worked, obviously you know, people talk about pad work and bag work. And I said, listen, bag and pad, pads don't hit your back. You only learn, you only really learn when you're in combat. You learn when you're in the boxing ring. I mean, you can learn certain things and get much fitter doing your, your gym work and stuff and road work and everything else you need to do. But to actually learn the, the skill the skill set, you need to box. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, these days, I don't know if you see all the, the fancy pad work, but a lot of people I talk to, including myself, it's, it, that's kind of for show. That doesn't really translate to real fighting. All you've got, you got to say to any of them, Marco, just say to any of those guys who do that fancy pad work, have you ever seen any of them throw one of those combinations in a fight? Never. Look at Floyd. Floyd was that skillful one. He'd make you miss, make you pay one punch, two punches. On, on the pads, he's doing you know, 50 punch combinations, 20 punch combinations. But yeah, never did it in the fight. So yeah, I mean, that, that, that's that. It's, they're just a hype. And just like I said, what I learned from the best, I believe the best trainer ever was Emmanuel Stewart. And what I learned that if you're going to do pads, you've got to treat those pads as if they're your, your opponent. Pads don't hit you you got to go backwards and you've got to act as if the pads are obviously the opponent. So you're not going forward, catching all these punches fast. And that. You're moving back slowly like, like your opponent would. And then Emmanuel Stewart was a genius at that. He is. He is. Uh, Jeremy is finally here. He's late, but he's here. Um, yeah, Emmanuel was great. Um, so so you turned amateur, at, you turned pro after uh, being a pretty successful amateur. Hello, Jeremy. Better late than never. Um, hey, Jeremy. Wake up, mate. Jeremy, you there? What's he doing? Lights on, nobody home. <laughs> I hope. Oh, it's freezing. Okay, I was like, that's unprofessional. Um, so, so, so you turned him. Uh, you turned pro, and and how were you able? And I don't know if this is. I know this isn't common for 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 America and for most uh, weight classes, but how were you able to get a title shot after your seventh? Pro fight at your seventh pro fight. Pretty simple. Well, um, first of all, my trainer and I believed that we were ready. Well, not that I had much, but the, the champion at the time was a new champion from, from Japan. The IBF was a new, was a new belt. It was a new, one of the newest organisations. And um, yeah, obviously the Japanese guy thought that he would beat me, and we offered him a large amount of money. And they thought they would come to Australia and beat this inexperienced guy. And then uh, the fight was done. I mean, like I said, um. Wow, when, when, when I think of it, it was a fight was cancelled for three months, so it would have been like maybe um, if, if the fight was we were supposed to be the first time, we would have done it in 100, 120 days, you know. So um, it was just crazy, but it all happened. Listen, everything happens because of money. So um, I'm, one of the, I'm one of the honest guys. And yeah, was I, did I deserve the shot before the other guys? No, I didn't, but I got it. My promoter uh, uh, the, the right money, and uh, they came here. Obviously, they came here for two reasons. One, because they got the money, and two, because they thought this inexperienced guy, they'd, they'd walk through him. Mm, yeah, I mean, and, and obviously, you know, you, 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 you stop him, and you win the title, and you were, how old were you at that point? 20. 
Wow. Yeah. So do you remember, I mean, how does the 20 year old, cause you know, at the time you don't realize it, but now that you're older, you realize 20 is just a child. I mean, how did you feel at that point? Do you remember? Yeah, obviously I feel crazy. I mean, listen, I want people to know this as I speak, fame and fortune changes everybody. Well, that didn't change me that day, but as I got more famous and made more money, uh, it changed, anybody that says they stay the same, they remember, of course I remember where I came from and all the rest of that, you know, that stuff, but uh, it changes you automatically. And like I said, I'll, I'll give you a little example of that because I got $20,000 for that fight, $20,000. Back then, anyway, but I said to my best friend back then, I said, listen, hey, Mate, if I get another twenty thousand, I'm out of this sport. I'm not going to fight no more. I thought if I was forty, if I had forty thousand dollars, I was going to be rich. You know, and all of a sudden, my next fight, I got fifty thousand, eighty thousand, a hundred. So it's it's just crazy. But like I said, I do remember. Like I've said it all my life. You know that. Um, you know, many on many years. Yeah, you know, I I haven't changed. But when I think back, it was just a lie. But because uh, I I change. Fame and fortune changes everybody. It's hard not to. I mean, you know, and we don't have a. We have, we have all these different lessons and tools for learning all these different things, but nobody ever teaches you how to handle success or what's going to happen with success. You know, there, there's, no, there, there's no book on handling success, you know. So I, always, I always think of many different things and I say to myself, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, it's really hard once you become, yeah, you go well, from driving a, a shitbox car to driving a brand new car, you go from living somewhere to, to moving somewhere else, you go from eating at home to eating at beautiful restaurants every night. And then the worst thing and the biggest thing is, mate, because you're a celebrity, you don't even have to pay for the food because they give you all for nothing. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. The world's crazy. You know, so you talk about the success, you know, out of your 29 wins, I think you had 21 knockouts, which is, especially for your weight, extraordinarily high percentage. More, of more extraordinarily high when I fought with two broken hands, Marco. My Ooh. hands are broken every fight. Really? Quite a oh, wow. My, my hands... Wow, I've, I've had more injections in my hands than any, I think any athletes had in anything in their life. You know, like they get injections at sparring that, to, to spar, you know? Wow. So, so your hands were bothering you throughout your whole pro career, you're saying? Oh, yeah. I had, well, in my first, my first time I ever won the Australian amateur title, and um, I had to stay up all night with my hands in ice so I could just, just to have the swelling stay down so I could pass to the doctor, you know? So, um, yeah, my hands were, yeah, my hands were at seven operations. I've had pins put in both. In every fight, when I fought, um, when I fought for my third world title, I fought with a broken right hand. It was broken prior to the fight. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, but I guess what I was going to ask you was, speaking of 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 um, getting y your head big, when you were knocking all, because you were knocking out everybody, was there a point where you started kind of not maybe training as hard and and being overconfident, or did that not happen? No, I always trained out. I, I knew that. Yeah, the the recipe for success was. Training up, but like I said, I can tell you other things that I'd done that kind of took me off the road. Like I said, and where, where I used to run at five in the morning, it was all right towards the end to run at six or seven, you know, where I, you know, all those kind of things. Those, where I used to have all my meals cooked at home, I'd go to the restaurant and say, Can you steam me some vegetables? Of course, they're not steam, they've been there for a day or two. But I tell you, and you, listen, it's what you believe. I'm, I'm one of those guys who never took any, any vitamins and stuff because I thought to myself, if, you, if I take those things and have to depend on them, then if you forget something, you always depend. I was just one of the guys that just went out there, worked hard, and knew that my hard work would get me the results. Okay. Okay. No, that's that, that sounds right. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, so all right. So so you win first. You win the bantamweight title, um, and then you win the super bantamweight title, right? Let me go uh, back a second, Mark. I've got to remember. So people don't know this. So when I won the bantamweight title, I defended it three times. So when I moved up, I'd never lost my bantamweight title. Yeah. Then I go to Super Beanaway. I defend that three times. Never lost my title. Then I go to Featherway. I defend that three times. I've never lost my title. So every one of my world titles that I, that I won, I've never lost. I've never lost one. Of, I've never lost one of my world title fights. I moved and, up to the next weight, and whatever happened happened. But yeah, I, I've never lost one of my belts. Well, you know, I remember you fighting Azuma Nelson. Those are probably, I would say, your most famous fights, right? Um, they, and I. They, you guys, but not to me, you know. Yeah. Not to you. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you in a second about your foot most. But uh, the first Azuma Nelson fight, I remember thinking it was a draw, right? But I thought that you won that fight. You know, most people did, right? So does the rest of the world. The judges, the, 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 the commentator gave me nine rounds to three. I think, I, I think that, was, that was no problem. I, you know, maybe it was 10 rounds or two. 
I mean, maybe, yeah, but like I said, I won the fight. Yeah, with it. Listen, one, one thing that upsets me about boxing, Mark, is that, with, like, Azuma the day after the fight when they put his hand up after the fight, he walked around putting his hand up. For me, what a great fighter. What a, what a champion he's. But, you know, when I, if I have a fight with you, you know if I build you or you, you know who wins the fight. He knows you never won that fight. He's like, if, if he doesn't, if he, if he does honestly think he won the fight, he should never been allowed to fight again after that because something's wrong with his brain. But, I mean, there was nothing wrong. It's like just, the, the, the sport's corrupt. The sport, not, if you're with the right people, you're with Don King, of course, just put your hands up because the odds are you're going to get the decision. You know? I mean, like I said, I won that. Listen, I, I, I don't say this. You know, although that was a, a great fight, that was nowhere near, near what my toughest fight I've ever had. Nowhere near it. But, oh, yeah. The rematch, look what he done to me. He went back home and trained and I... Like I said, I trained, but like I said, I've done lots of things wrong. And then whether it's being with girls and doing everything I've done, just right in that, that barrel of success. When I came home after the draw with the Zuma Nelson, I'm the biggest hero in Australian sport. He's this athlete that's been live and whatever. Listen, again, I had my own clothing line coming after. I'm doing, they're going to do my life story in, in Hollywood. So I'm doing all this stuff. And obviously, of course, I, I want to win the fight. And of course, I thought I'd win the fight. But my, my head was everywhere else, you know, so... Yeah, no excuse. He was, he was the better man. He prepared better for the fight. So I'll never make an excuse in my life, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, the first fight, you know, you, you, you wobbled him numerous times. Um, you know, yeah, you had a number. Um, so Mark, in the... If it was 15 rounds, I would have knocked him out the next round. Had they not hit his mouth guard? Had, you know, like I said, if you look at the, end, the, the last punch of the fight in the 12th round, I hold him up. He's going to fall. I wish I let but no. Sports, no, I'm not going to let him fall. Bill gone. But I hold him up. You know, um, yeah, so um, that then still, yeah, you know, like I said, the judges were, were just corrupt. And they weren't corrupt in that way. That, that they were either corrupt or they're incompetent. And, I, and I'm more commonly saying they're incompetent because a lot of these guys, I watch them every day and they're hopeless. But the, 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 the saddest thing is about our sport, Mark, is that if you can't do this podcast, you're not going to be here next week. You're going to say, you can do shit. Get away. But the, the, the boxing judges, where they score right or score wrong, they've got a job next week. So they travel the world. They, why didn't they want to be boxing judges? Because when they travel the world, they go to places like Thailand and all those other places. They get their food fed to them. They get girls sent to their rooms. So I'm just, I just being honest, you know? Absolutely. These guys, these guys are all in the sport for the wrong shit reasons. If they were in the sport for the right reason and they knew how to score a fight, I would be four-time world champion in the shortest time in history. Floyd Mayweather won it in 10 years. That was my sixth year of boxing. My sixth year of boxing with two and a half years off with hand operations. Wow. You know, people, people don't realize, non-boxers don't realize how much goes into a fight. So when a judge does that, it's like ripping a part of your soul out. You know? Well, was, Mark, and I'm not going to put this down to any, but I was never the same after the fight. I came home after the fight, not hurt. I mean, I was a hero. But um, I'll never forget, um, a few months later when I started to train again, I got hurt a couple of times in sparring where I've never been hurt in my career. Spar blood, heavyweight, heavyweight, never been hurt. Never. I never got hurt in that fight once against the Zuma. Yeah, it might hit me, but never got hurt once. I, I, if he hurt me, I'd say, yeah, he rocked. Never, never hurt me once in the fight. And things change. I don't know if something was taken away from me or, or what it was, but just, yeah, it wasn't the same, Mark, you know? Did, did you, have you ever spoken to Azuma face to face about that first fight? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, you know, he, well, you know, he says I was tough. Yeah, he, he's, yeah, like I said, he's a, he's a bit delusional because, like I said, um, yeah, he come back and, yeah, he beat me in the rematch, which is amazing. And like I said, um, but like I said, um, had I won that fight, there was no rematch. I was going to go and fight Puno Whitaker next, you know? So, um, yeah, hey, look, everything in life happens for a reason. I Look, mate, like I said, I, I truly believe that Azuma Nelson is one of the greatest, if not the greatest African fighter in history. One yeah. of the most beautiful people you'll ever meet. Yeah, a total gentleman. So, look, um, yeah, maybe because I was a little prick of a kid, you know, karma paid me back. Yeah, but I'm just saying, um, good luck to him and congratulations. But like I said, um, had, you yeah, listen, in, in one of Manny Pacquiao's fights when he lost it against Jeff Horn, they wanted to take it back and, re and they rejudged the fight. And Jeff Horn won. What? Just let three judges go and watch my fight. And if any three judges in the history today say there, there wouldn't be one judge that's going to get in the fight. Yeah, there should definitely <laughs> There should be an, some kind of an appeals process with this kind of thing where you can overturn it, you know, but there, there's just really... I mean, listen, we have cameras, we have video, you know what I mean? In all sports, we use that in basketball, in AFL, in, in NFL. In, yeah, we, use, we use the, the, the yeah, like I said, I'm, like I said, um, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, listen, if I had one world title, I'd be, I'd be more than content. But, um, you know, yeah, 
Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. But, you know, you know, even things like replay, there's so many things because boxing is, is way more at stake, I feel like, than football, than basketball. You know, your lives are at stake. You so much. So and, and, one, and, and one decision, listen, I'm going to give you an example. It's, uh, it's the terms is you can go from the shit house to the penthouse or the penthouse to the shit house in boxing <laughs> very quick. I know one of the greatest fighters back in the year, I won't mention him, my great friend, but he got $2 million to fight in, I fought in June. So he fought in May of the same year that I fought Azuma. He lost the fight. His next fight, he got $20,000. Wow. Yeah, and he was a world champion. He got $20,000 to fight in Australia. You know? Wow. Wow. That's boxing, you know? yeah. That's, you know? So, who, what? So you said before, Azuma wasn't your hardest fight. Who was your toughest fight? Uh, Marcus Villasana, who also fought Nelson and beat him, but they never gave him a decision. And Victor Kalajis, who I fought for my third world title, was wow, the best puncher I fought by far. If, if I've ever been hit, hurt in one fight, it was in that fight. That's the only fight I really remember being being stunned and rocked it was against him in the first round. Oh, uh, okay. So now, so um, is there anybody that you would spar? Any world champions people that I would recognize that you would spar that you could talk about? Like, oh man, I sparred the great Greg Howen. I sparred Rod, uh, uh, Roger Mayweather. I sparred Jeff Hart. Jeff Harding, who's the lightweight champion of the world, was my my sparring partner every day. Jeff, was the like, big guy. Yeah, he, I, was, I was the featherweight. He was the he was the lightweight, and and his sparring partner I took around the world with me as my sparring partner, another one anyway. So yeah. Wow. Guys, yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so you would you would spar bigger guys for what? Just you can get used to a hard punch and be able to. No, no, that's the worst thing to get used to. That's a, that's a. a I'm, I'm happy you said that because maybe doing that early in my career, maybe ending my career earlier because those bigger guys were hitting me. And like I said, you just got water on on on, on the rock, and after time it'll it'll evaporate it. So it's the same. Yeah. And like I said, um, you can get a knee reconstruction or an elbow or a shoulder you, but once your chin starts getting when you start getting hurt from punches there's nothing there's nothing you can fix that chin with wow. um is there anybody who you really wanted to fight career but you never got the chance to yeah, to be honest i would have loved at that time i would have loved, I would have loved to fight barry mcgregor but I, i'm not one of those guys who call people out i would have loved to fight whoever whoever was the best look i would have loved to fight the, the wba world champion but they would never fight me you know uh, yeah, um, and he's a great fighter. But um, I'm just thinking, you know, all the guys that in my division, back then, it wasn't like it is today. Um, you, you, the longer you kept your title, the more money you made, and all these people, the, the hawks and the, the people who live off you, they don't want you to take the risk. And if, if they think there's a risk, they're going to be able to defend the title three more times where they make money. But that's what boxing's about, all these other, you know, parasites that hang off all of us guys and, and, and just make money off us, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So those are the few guys that you wanted to fight. Um, what? Um, how? What? Talk me through. How did the fight with Azuma Nelson come about? When you guys were both, you know, he was forty nine, yeah. forty three. Yeah, I'm happy to bring that up too. Because I didn't even call him a fight. I don't, I don't put that on. Right. So I, didn't, I'm, I never beat no Azuma Nelson. That's not Azuma Nelson. I was bringing Santa Claus, and I was bringing one of the I'm one of the reindeers. You know. <laughs> but let me tell you what happened. So I was traveling the world doing some stuff and I was in Bangkok and I was, all, I was taking people over um, on holidays and tours with Jeff Fennick, VIP tour, getting them in all these exclusive places and doing these things. And I thought, wow, when I went to Bangkok, somebody said, Jeff, you should maybe fight Samant Pakun, the guy who won my second world title. Do a, you know, another, ex do something with him and you know, all, get all the people to come and watch and bring them from Australia. So I organised it all. And about six weeks prior to it, he pulled out. And my friend who lives in Bangkok said, Jeff, let's try to get a Zoom with us. And that's how it happened. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So we, and so like I said, but I don't, I don't, please, I don't claim that as a victory. I don't claim that as a fight. Why not? Because you guys were both because, old. Yeah. I mean, listen, I trained my ass off. I trained hard. Again, I had a, when I fought, I had a broken rib. I fought him with a broken rib. I was in so much pain. And I'm sure somebody told him that the first punch he hit me was in my rib. But um, like I said, um, for him even to get back in and for, listen, if, I don't know if you watch it, but it went 10 rounds at a better pace than any fight you're watching today is going to go, trust yep. me, because that, that, we're both warriors. But like I said, I don't count that as a fight. I don't even think of it, you know. When people ask me, I just, it was just a, a way that I made a little bit of money. Not that I needed the money then, but just because I was doing traveling, I just, somebody threw this idea up and I'd done it. So, so was there any part of you that kind of felt a little bit of revenge 
for in that fight or no? No, not at all. No, no because no, not at all. Um, no, nothing at all. I mean, yeah, I was just for me it was a proud day that to think that I was forty four. I just went ten rounds with again just with somebody else who trained out there. But like I said, no, there's no. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's the, yeah, you know, the, the only revenge I would get is if the WBC and like, hopefully they're going to listen to this would sit down and watch my fight and say, Jeff Fennig won, just give me my belt. Yeah, go get get three experts, get get the three best fighters in history, whoever they want to call, tell them to sit down. Like the ten of us, ten of the best fighters in history, just recently picked all the the best ten fights in the world. We picked all the best fights in history. Get them ten guys to see if, if one person says Azuma Nelson won more than three rounds. Give me my I, belt. I was going to say, give me what I worked my ass off for. Right. I was going to say that they should create some kind of a. a a union of, of not just five or ten, but maybe hundreds of judges so they could all judge. And then when you have such a huge sample size, that really gives an accurate depiction of who people think won, you know, and you would easily and how, win. And listen, how good would that be for the sport of boxing? What what credibility would those guys get? They're, they're doing something. That, listen, and like I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the truth about the sport of boxing. The truth about the sport of boxing is those judges and those referees and stuff who travel, if I'm Don King, and every time I've got a fight night on, I'm sending you to the Philippines. I'm sending you to Bangkok. I'm spoiling with food and girls. Let's see. Hope their wives listen because girls get sent to their room. All the all the all the extras are there, and and it's, and it's a close fight. Of course they're gonna gonna give it to Don's fighter, and not 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 on purpose. I'm not saying they cheat. It's just in their head. They're not stupid. This is the guy with bread and butter. This is the guy with the pacing. I'm not gonna, so they, in a way they think they're not cheating, but they're doing it irresponsibly. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're doing it. Yeah, it's just, yeah. They're, you know, in their mind, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fuck up Don King, or I'm not gonna uh, destroy my relationship with Bob Arum, or I'm not gonna destroy whoever Oscar. It, it, it's crazy, but that's that's the way it is. That's yeah. the way the world operates. We all know that. You know, we we all try to be loyal to the people who are loyal to us. Right, right. No, absolutely. Um, so you kind of looked at at that last fight as an exhibition. Speaking of that, what do you think about, you know, Tyson versus Roy Jones? And I know you, you helped train Tyson for that, right? Yeah, well, no. Well, I was just with Mike recently. I was just with Mike as he's getting ready for Lennox Lewis, you know? So, so with that... <laughs> yeah, that's happened. Mike Tyson, Lennox Lewis happened in February, March in Miami. And what do I think, Cam, to be honest? I don't like it. Why? But, but, well, because... They're in their 50s and they don't need to be hit. Yeah? They don't need money. They don't need to be hit, you know. Um, you know, it's a uh, concussion and, and stuff is a, a very, very serious, uh, very, very serious thing. I've, I've, I've only learned that as I've got older and some days I forget things and do things that are so stupid. And I could talk to you and like I said, if you didn't ring me three hours ago, I didn't keep writing down and come in and saying I have to be, I might have just went somewhere else. So, I mean, I know, yeah, and, and I haven't been hit in the head a lot of times, but still, yeah. When you're being hit in the head enough times through sparring, yeah, your memory your memory goes. And as you get older, it goes. So I don't believe that it's, it's a great thing. But look, the only great thing that I love about what Mike's doing is Mike's changed his whole world around. For Mike Tyson to be able to come from where he comes from, I've been there where I thought he was going to be dead the next day. I've been, you know, he's been through everything. He's been through the, 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 maybe the roughest roller coaster ride in the history of roller coasters. But he's there and he's showing people that at 56 years of age, you can, you can get fit and get ready to do this. I would love it to end there and yeah. get going, people. But um, look, um, he's my friend again. What, what I said about what we do, as, as much as we think it's wrong or if it's right or wrong, I'll still support him, you know. I was over there helping him train last week. So so are you going to be in his corner for the actual fight? I'm not 100% sure. Because um, they've asked my young j boxer, Brock Jarvis, to fight on the undercard. If um, Eddie Hearn allows it, when I talk to Eddie and the boys, if that happens, of course, I'll, um, I'd love to be there to help Mike. I'm very, very sure Mike would, would have me there because prior to when COVID starting just over two years ago, my last dinner was with Mike in a, in a, in a beautiful little restaurant in LA called Craig's. And um, he asked me to come back to be his trainer for this. And then um, because of COVID, obviously. Um, do, you, do you know the details of the fight? Is, there, is it what ounce gloves? How many rounds? How many minutes? No, I, I really don't. But. Um, Look, the, the shorter the better. And, you know, like I said, um, I hope. Oh, like I said, I don't know. I hope they go out there and, and, and look after each other. But um, that's not what the people want, you know. But um, who knows? With Mike and Lennox, who knows what's going to happen? All I know, they were two of the greatest fighters ever. Two of the greatest anyway. Two of the greatest people. They're my great friends, and I don't want either of them to get hurt. 
And, you know, for Mike, there has to be has to be some aspect of redemption of revenge in that fight, right? It has to be. Yeah, it would be, listen, it'd be very hard, like I said, even if they're pulling up punches. If one of them lands with a 60 or 50% punch, that still oh, rocked you because you're 56. Your first instinct is, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you back. You hit me, I'm going to hit you. So it, it could turn pretty serious. I, I think it will turn serious because, like I said, a jab today, if somebody jab me, it's going to hurt me. Somebody taps me, it, it's not the same. I've let bent down the other week to get a drink out of the fridge and hurt my back. So it's, we're, we're not young anymore. Do you, um, do, you, do you still work out, hit the bag? I don't hit the bag, but I uh, ride bike every day. I do some, some light weights. I, I, I run, yeah, I train every day, yeah. Train, uh, oh, try, oh, yeah. Boxing training? No. Nah. But I train all my boys, but no, nah, I don't do boxing training. Um, boxing training is over a long time. From, I'm more than happy that boxing's gone. Yeah, yeah, no, I can imagine. I can imagine. You know, I didn't do it at your level, so for me, I love hitting the bag just because it's just it clears your head. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah. Um. So, w speaking of of those kind of exhibition fights, what's your take on like Jake Paul, Logan Paul, these YouTuber guys? Do you think it's good for the sport, or do you think it's kind of you think I it makes? Say, I say it straight down the middle of it again. So Jake Paul in doing that money, mate. If I could do it, I'd do it tomorrow. If I was but, but for the boxing. People to let it, it's shit, it's bullshit. Hey, let, tell them to go and train. Tell them to make a weight division and, 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 and go through the ranks. You know? Like well, I mean, he, he's oh, fighting. Man, if, if you can do it without doing it, good, but I'll take my hat off to him. I bless you. I think you're amazing. You're the smartest guy in the world. If you're going to earn that money, great. But for the sport, it's, it's terrible for our sport. It's shit for our sport. You think it is? I mean, so he's fighting Tommy Fury, right? How do you see that going? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. I've watched Tommy Fury in his last fight and stuff, and look, he's got a, a good skill level. I've watched the Paul brothers, and they're freaking strong. Yeah, but they're I, not take, bad. I take my hat off to them, you know. Yeah, and and listen, they believe in themselves, but there's a process. You you you, you fight you, um, as a fighter, as a listen, as a as a builder, as a bricklayer, as a carpenter. You do your apprenticeship, and then you then you, then you, then you're out of there. These guys are doing, there's no apprenticeship. They're going straight to the top. And again, good luck. I'm not, I'm not one bit jealous, not one bit. So I'm, not, I'm not saying in an envious way. I'm saying in, 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 a, in a real way, the way people look at this. I'm saying, and this is the only way I look at it. Mate, if your son could earn $10 million, well, hopefully without getting hurt, go and earn it. But like I said, um, we want we like to serve our apprenticeship and get $1,000 and $1,500 and fight for it. Yeah, so it's, you know. I mean, that's, that's I think, the problem. A lot of fighters are, are have a have a salty taste in their mouth because you know Jake Paul made uh, seven hundred thousand dollars his last fight you know in his hey, you know, he, uh, well I mean that's what his his purse was probably with back end and all that more right yeah. um, so a lot of fighters don't make that for world championship fights so a lot of hundred oh, percent yeah yeah. I, like how do you think if you were fighting and there was social media it probably would have been a way different story as well right. Oh, definitely so. But like I said, I'm, look, none of my boys get on social media and talk. But my, my boys don't do that. We're not in that. I let my boys do it. Of course, you get in the way and they'll have a look and whatever. If you've got something to say, we'll say something back then. But uh, not, it's not for me. It's just that uh, my boys let their fists do the talking. That's what I believe. I said, yeah, uh, all my life, all my life, I let my, in my career, I let my fists do the talking. And then um, I had a massive fan base. I was most, one, of the most, one of the most popular sport, Australian sportings ever. You know, yeah, ever. You know, so um, yeah, I'm uh, we had no social media. I didn't need it. So your 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 sons are are fighters now? No, my boxers. I don't. Not my sons. My the boys who I train. Oh, oh, okay. Do you have Do you have any kids who are fighters? I've got some good boys. I've got a boy who just fought in America. His name's Brock Jarvis. Uh, he's twenty and oh, AB knockouts. Yeah, and he doesn't. Yeah, he's amazing potential, but he doesn't talk. He never. He'll never say nothing about his opponent until until till fight till the fight. So. Changing gear a little bit, who to you, uh, this always is fascinating to me, especially talking to you know, legendary fighters like yourself, who, in your opinion, are the top three greatest fighters of all time? Without any doubt. Um, and you can't, you got, you exclude yeah. yourself. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to say fighters. I'm not going to, uh, like, my, people, people say Muhammad Ali. Or I, I, Muhammad Ali was maybe the greatest thing that happened in the sport for humanity. Just I for, for, agree for, with you. But I don't believe, I don't believe he was as good as Joe Lewis. I believe Joe Lewis, uh, Sugar Ray Robinson, and then there's a dead heat for me between Ray Lennon and Roberto Duran. 
I agree with you. I agree, I agree with, the, with the thing about Muhammad Ali. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Okay. Um, Everybody loves him. I love him. I've met him. I, what a, how magical was it? But I, I believe that Mike Tyson at his peak would have beat Muhammad Ali. That's my opinion. That's just my opinion, you know? I mean, you know? it makes sense because of the similarity with Joe Frazier, but Tyson was had oh, what you Tyson think. punched Tyson punched much better than Joe Frazier. Much, much, yeah. more Frazier, much more power. And in bunches. So yeah, I mean, yeah, no, listen. And and the one thing about boxing that all gonna know is styles make fights. Here we go. Thomas Hearn beats Iran Barkley twice. Roberto Duran beats Iran Barkley. Thomas Hearn's not Roberto Duran in, in, in a round or so. So it's just yeah, styles make fights. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but still, so, when, I, when I think a great fight is Roberto Duran was just was just a, at the lightweight division, yeah, unbelievable. No, Julio Cesar Chavez, um, unbelievable, you know. Yeah, totally right. I, you know, when I turned amateur, I went and I was living in Catskill with Kevin Rooney, so he was training me. Yes. So I learned that style. Now, for me, the style didn't work out because you have to be you know five eleven, which was kind of tall for a super middleweight at the time. But that style was perfect for Mike because his size, his aggression, his speed. Yes. You know, um, so, yeah, styles do make fights, absolutely. And one of the things you said, I want to say again, so hopefully these listeners learn from this as well. Everybody's different. We can't train everybody the same. Everybody has a different skill set. Yeah, Mike's straight at that little in and out, that little pivot this side, pivot that side, punch out the middle, punch out the side. That's where Mike gets his power from, those, those huge little um, hips and his backside and the, those, you know, the hammies and, yeah, yeah, strong foot, yeah, but not everybody's, yeah, so if you, if you don't get a guy built like that, you've got, to, you've got to teach him a different style, so you can't teach everybody the same style, I've learned that, you know? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's absolutely true, um, so who, of the fighters right now, um, who do you like? Yeah, I like the female, I like, um, I love Devin Haney. Uh, Shakur Stevenson, his last fight really, really impressed me. He was a little, you know, so so early. In the, in the, in the, I like those guys in the little weights because they, they throw a lot more punches. And look, we all talk about Canelo. Everybody's talking about Canelo. Well, look, Canelo's great because he's beaten everybody. But um, man, they don't. There's no action in the fight, and, and, and when that is, it's always late. I mean, that's the way he fights. But I mean, for me, with a guy so big and so strong and so robust, I would have him go on doing what he's doing in round seven and eight and round one and two and the fights will be over in round four or five. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think that that's a choice of his or do you think he just can't get in until a few rounds? You know, he, he can't figure the guy out and the speed's too much for yeah. him. And... Then, then, then it's up to the guy who teaches you how to get in. Mm. There's, a, there's an easy method of getting in. It's, it's, it's not a hard look at Mike Tyson. He did it against everybody from round one to whenever he wanted to. You know, look yeah. at Jeff could do it any round. I mean, I did it from round one, yeah? Look at, you who did? Look at Roberto Duran. I mean, yeah, it's, it's how you talk, you know? Yeah, yeah take, like I said, um, that's the one thing, and I'm not uh, saying anyone else is doing a great job. He's got some great fighters. But um, Emmanuel Stewart was somebody who prepared you for a fight. The guy, the first thing he looked at your fight, he, yeah, he would tell you who you're fighting, how he fights, how you have to fight him. And, uh, yeah, he would, he would have a, a great plan for you. And then you just go out and... And, you know, just do what you needed to do, you know. But I'm this kind of guy. Listen, I don't care who you are, who you fight. If I make you fight my fight, I'm going to beat you. So the, 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 the war of attrition is me, you trying to box, I'm trying to get in close. If I can get in close then, and I've done that on the majority of the fights, so I beat everybody. You did. Um... Everybody thought they could outbox me, Marco, but they couldn't because I got, I got in there. You I would get... great boxers, Jerome Coffey, uh, Steve McCrory, Greg Richardson. They all went on to win world title, but I'm still, you know, I, I beat them all. You did. I mean, yeah, but you, you know, what you did was also, you, you were very, you were a special fighter. There's not many that did what you did and had your skill set. So, you know, you saying it, it's easy, but most people can't do that. Um, I think, I think uh, David Benavidez has a good chance yeah. of beating Canelo. Amazing prospect. He's, he's, he's about 6'4", six, 6'3". Six, my good friend. Oh, your LA, friend. No, my good friend in LA, Frank Stallone, is a huge fan of yeah, Benavides, yeah. yeah, he can fight. Boy can fight and can he, punch. He can fight. He can punch. He's tall. He's young. Um, he has, you know, he, he he. In my opinion, he's the only person who could maybe give a serious threat, be a serious threat to Canelo. I mean, yeah, is see, there... I, I, I give an example of one of Canelo's fights. I know he was young, but when he fought Floyd, he you are fifteen kilos or fifteen pounds. Everything. Use it. Use it. Get your trainer to teach you how to use it. What do you do? Try to box. You try to jab. You can't. 
Nobody's going to out jab Troy. Nobody. You know, and, but he tried to do that. You know, so you know, use him, throw him on the floor, do be dirty, do what you have to do, try to upset him. But no, you know, just contend to get jabbed, make him miss, make him pay. But no, that wouldn't be it. But I'll be, I'll be kneeing him, elbowing him, headbutting him, doing whatever I have to do to to, to upset him, getting him close. Yeah. Um, when you were fighting, was there ever a point that you were, or what was the point, if there was, that you remember when you kind of started losing the passion and kind of feeling like you're kind of on your way out in, mentally? Yeah, um, I went through it a couple of times, but um, it was, uh, yeah, just, yeah, when you know, when, you, when you're not getting up at early and doing what you have to do and you know, when, when, look, like I said, I can tell anybody how great it was, it never happened. But you can't lie to the mirror. I always tell everybody, the mirror is the ultimate judge. When you look at that, you know, you can't lie. You can't lie to the mirror. You can't lie to yourself. You can lie to everybody else. And they'll all agree and give you a pat on the back because of all the success and everything they want to be around you because they're the, the leeches. But at the end of the day, um, yeah, I, yeah, I knew on, on a lot of occasions that, um, you know, I, I wasn't taking shortcuts, but I was doing things that were unnecessary that weren't going to help my performance. But I, mm. I continue because... I continue to do it because it was enjoyable. I was this world champion that, was get, that, that, that got things that nobody else could get. And, yeah, anything I wanted, I got. So, so you don't want to say, it was never a sport brat, but I was in ways, you know. Did I like who I was when I was a three-time world champion? I tell him, I don't even like that person. I don't like him. You know, I don't like him because he was a fucking stuck-up prick, really, but he didn't. He lied to everybody. Yeah, he, I, I lied to everybody. I pretend I was this humble guy, though. That I couldn't be happy to be humble when you got... You know, you come from where I come, you've got all this money, you've got a car, you've got, you got, look, there, 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 are, there are people with no money that walk in the street, live in the street, but I go to the restaurant, I get food for nothing. But at the same time, you need that arrogance to be at that high level, no? Uh, I think, I think early having the arrogance and stuff is, is really important. You've got to, you know, you've got to believe in yourself and stuff. But like I said, um, I'm this kind of guy. I think that some guys overbelieve. Um, like I said, I was just a realist. I just, yeah, I... I believe that I could beat anybody, no problem about that. But it was, I wasn't this kind of person I thought that, you know, I, mean, you know, I, 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 want to, I wasn't a guy that was outspoken. To myself, I'd believe that, but I wouldn't say that yeah, to many other people. Yeah, of course I believe it. If it was my trainer, or if you said to me, are you worried? Of course I'm going to say no, because if I said yes, then, you know. But like I said, you've got to, you've got to, you, there, there can be no, there can be no bravery without fear. Unless you, and I, I used to be nervous before every fight. People, you know, shit, here was I nervous? Of course I was nervous. If I wasn't nervous, I'm not ready. You've got to be nervous to be ready. If I'm not nervous, I'm going out there not worrying about something. This guy's trying to knock me out. I've got to be worried about him. So being nervous and being a little scared and being frightened, it's, it's all part of being successful and being brave and, 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 and conquering. Yeah, it's the fight, fight or flight response. And you always, and that has to be triggered by some kind of fear. And then your response is always fight, you know, not flight. No doubt. Um, like I said, um, there are times where I wish I, you know, um, had learned to, to to be able to fight and to, to, to move around a bit. But um, yeah, my, my style was um, just what was really one way, you know. Like I said, no disrespect to anybody, but um, yeah, my whole career was just about I destroyed everybody in sparring, in fights, and nobody ever tried to say, you know, what's going to happen if one day you can't destroy somebody? What are you going to have to do? So, you know, but, yeah, but all, it's all about learning, and that's why. I'm going to be a better. I'm going to be a better teacher, a better trainer than I was a fighter. You know, what would have been a great fight. You versus Prince Nassim. Yeah, oh, I would have loved to fight him. Oof, that would have been a great yeah. fight. And again, he and I'm a great fighter. Yeah, great little fighter. Great, great movement, great power for a little. Yeah, but um, yeah, yeah. I've met but, Prince a few times. He's a lovely guy. But yeah, I would have loved that. Yeah. How tall are you? About five eight. Yeah, yeah. So you were pretty tall for your weight. I showed you a photo. Naz is up to here on me. Yeah, Naz is about yeah. five feet, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's tiny, he's tiny. Yeah, but yeah, but like I said, um, amazing puncher, you know. And, and but yeah. with you, that that's something that I feel like it made, made your style even more special because most guys that tall, being good inside fighters, it's not usually their forte, right? Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. And like I said, uh, yeah, that was just what I loved. And, and and like I loved uh, my 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 goal for every round was to throw at least two hundred punches. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, what, Go and watch my Villasana fight. You know, people have been watching it late because I, I put it up years after because I didn't not, not know much about this stuff. It's only said like 700,000 views or something at the moment. And then, uh, it, well, nobody can believe the fight, you know. Me and him, 
from round one to round 12, through punches nonstop. Great fight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So was there any fighter, name a fighter in any era, any generation that you would have loved to have fought? Yeah, see, I don't like doing that, but I would have fought anybody. I would have loved it. Man, listen, when I, when I look at what the guys who I, I idolize, like Chavez and Duran, man, I would have loved to test myself against them guys. And like I said, when I, Greg Howard, I sparred Greg Howard, who's a world champion, not, no fight, but he beat Vinny Paz, he beat all of them. I, I, you know, I sparred him, and yeah, says to me, Jeff was the hardest spar I've ever had, you know? Well, you know, he said a bit more than that, but I mean, yeah. I mean, I had no problem with any of these guys. So, you know, and when I, and when I was young, nobody hurt me. I got hurt towards the end of my career, like I said, because I'd be, just think, like I said, just think of hitting a brick wall with a hammer for a year, it's going to break, things break um, with, with more and more damage. And as I got hit more towards the end of my career, yeah, my resistance went, went uh, left me and that was it. But like I said, um, I've, listen, as, when I moved up to the featherweight division, I would fight any featherweight in the history of the game. And I have no doubt, again, he talked about cocky, I have no doubt that I would have, Competed, and I believe I could have beaten any 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 featherweight in history. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I've, I've, my, that's how that's my mindset. But I have no doubt, you know. And like I said, when that when 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 that was there, and I wasn't getting hurt, nobody could beat me because nobody was going to throw more punches than me. Um, I assume you wouldn't be open to doing a legends thing yourself. No, I would never do that. <laughs> why? Why not? Um, for a lot of reasons, because I I'm a advocate for uh, people with um, brain damage people I've donated my brain to the to brain surgery when I when I pass away because I want people to know that I, it doesn't need to be hit any more than it's been hit and I just don't you know like I said um, um, it may if they offered me 20 million dollars I wouldn't do it no only, only through principle that, that I would like people to think that and um, we need to look after our, we need to look after ourselves. We, you know, we need we need we need um, trainers with more care. Even in this in this fight in the fight days day, I try to make sure that if my fighters are getting punished. I will stop the fight. And in my last fight, my my, my fighter was nearly knocked out in the second round. But I was dying. Just, I just wanted to get him back because in LA you don't see the court. I just want to get him back. And I, he wouldn't remember me saying. I said, if the, if the round starts, and you're getting hit twice. I will stop the fight. He turned the fight around and won. But I knew he could do that. It was in round two when he got hit. If it was in round nine or ten, and he was hit towards him when we were top, I wouldn't have let that happen. So there's a reason to it all. There's a method to the madness. But no, I, I really um, do, and I have witnessed people who have been hit a lot and uh, have brain damage today. And they, they, they've got terrible lives. Their family have terrible lives. So I'm just trying to be an advocate to, yeah, for that no, to stop. You're right. You know, I, you know, I, I grew up boxed. And I interview a lot of people, and you're right. A, a, way more fighters than I would like are suffering in some way or another from all the blows. Yeah. You know? Um, so, yeah. So, well, look, man, I really appreciate you talking to me. Um, we'd, I'd love to do it again soon. Well, whatever um, you want. Whatever you want. Pick a topic, we can do it. I will. I'll, I'll hit you up. Thank you again. It was good talking to you, and, and we'll do it again soon. Say hello to your little friend, Nikki Wheeler, for me. Nikki, hello. I will. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Hey, guys. Thank you. Talk later. Always a pleasure.